If we've been asleep in the light, wake us up, oh Lord God. Oh, we thank you, Lord God. Wake us up, oh Lord, and cause us to be hungry for the things of God. Use us, Lord, in these last days. You said you've given an open window to your church. You said that to work while it is day for the night comes when no man can work. Lord, we thank you for your light. We thank you for your grace. We give you glory and honor, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We give you glory and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Before you go, Gabby, I just want you to be praying about, man, I don't know. I saw you worshiping the Lord back there, and I saw you doing this number here. And I'm just wondering, I don't know, your daddy was a drummer. You might want to pray about that. All right? Because we need a drummer. I know you're doing a lot, but hey, we need a drummer. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Y'all doing good tonight? I'm excited, man. I'm telling you. Look, I don't know, I don't know about you, but look, like I'm a, I love, I'm so grateful for the gift God gave me to be a preacher and a teacher of the gospel. Hallelujah. But look, when the word of God comes alive, huh? When the word of God comes alive, Thank you, Jesus, and gives teeth to the gospel. Amen. Oh, thank you, Lord. I tell you what, Brother, Brother Kirk and Sister Brenda, man, were such a great blessing for me. I was able to go hang out with them um, at Waffle House, and it was just even like we stayed up till way past midnight, and that was a blessing too. So anyway, I just want to thank them. Special thanks to, to y'all for coming and ministering. You know, I don't want to spend too much time talking about all these details, but I got to tell you that, uh, I got to tell you that God has just been speaking so much to me, like just laying in bed thinking, kind of even like Sister Brenda said, sometimes we just got to be quiet and listen. Oh my gosh, God's been correcting me. I've been on autocorrect. I'm just letting you know, the Lord's been, been correcting me. You know, one of the things that the Lord showed me, and I'll just share this with you, because, you know, I want to be transparent. I don't really care that much what people think about me to begin with. Never really did, and I definitely don't now. Um, but, you know, one of the things that the Lord showed me was is that, Matt, your motives are pure, or they're right, um, in that you desire to protect the body of Christ. At the same time, in all of your endeavor to protect that sometimes maybe you quench. Okay, I'm just telling you what the Lord told me. That, that sometimes in your overprotection and your need to feel like you got to have control of everything because you're scared wildfire is going to break out. You know, I done told you all about the old church I went to, and they had two women dancing in the church. And listen, I've seen women dance in Mexico, and it looked a whole lot different than them dancing that them women were doing. And then, you know, whenever one of those women would come over there, and she was like trying to, trying to summon something up out of me. I don't know what she was doing. But the point is this, is that... I've seen stuff that ain't right, and I've seen stuff that is right, and all I know is this, though, is that the Lord's not calling me, like, yeah, he's calling me to have wisdom, and he's calling me as a pastor to, to be led by him, but at the same time, the Lord said, look, Matt, just let me be God. Like even the night before I went to go get Sierra, what I told y'all was that the Lord's like, look at you, boy. You're like four steps ahead of everything. I'm not going to go into all the details. You're trying to be three to four steps ahead of everything. You're trying to play the role of God. You're trying to control the situation. You're not God. I am God, and you're just a man. Now, trust me and do what I said. Get on the road for 8 o'clock. Whatever happens after that, it's in the Lord's hand. And I just want to say this. You know, whenever you begin to see the manifestations of the gifts and you see people delivered, let me just say this. Now what do I do, preacher? Because, I mean, the lady that was up here ministering at the altar, she's not here anymore. Brother, brother Kirk and Sister Brenda in Dallas, what am I going to do? I'm going to tell you what you're going to do. You're going to stand up. You're going to rise up with your head and your mind right, just like the man of Gadarene, and fully clothed. Come on, fully clothed and in your right mind, and you're going to go forward. And like the Lord said, you will sin no more. Come on. Well, how am I going to sin no more, preacher? Is that even really reality? I'm going to tell you how you're going to sin no more. I'm going to tell you how you're going to walk in the truth of the gospel because you are going to apply yourself to the living word of God. And that the word of God ignited by the spirit of God is going to be revealed, begin to reveal to you the deeper truths of the word of God. 
The truth that Jesus Christ has already defeated principalities and powers when he died on the cross. The truth that Colossians 2.14 says you ha- he has triumphed over them and that now you have access to the same spirit. Hallelujah. Romans 8 and 11 that raised Jesus from the dead will also quicken your mortal body. And as you walk in the spirit and not in the flesh. Oh, come on, somebody. See, the flesh opposes the spirit of God. Galatians 5 and 17. For the spirit of the fle- lusts against the flesh and the flesh lusts against the spirit. They oppose one another so that you cannot do what you would. In your spirit, you desire if you're saved today. Come on, somebody, help me out. Are you saved tonight? If you're not saved, you can get saved right now. All you got to do is invite Jesus in. The resurrected Jesus. Oh, but I don't, I don't know that he resurrected. That means you're not saved. Hello, hold on. Let me not not get too excited. Let me not get too cocky because I want to be humble. But listen, if you don't know for sure whether Jesus rose from the dead, it means you're not saved tonight. Because when you get saved, the Bible says in Ephesians 1 and 13 that there's a witness that takes place. You get sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. When you hear that gospel, hallelujah, and you believe, you get sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. And now there's a witness in you that says, you can tell me what you want, doctor, sir, that I work with at the hospital. You can tell me what you want, ma'am, or whoever you are. You ain't going to convince me that Jesus ain't alive because he's living on the inside of my heart. And resurrection power has showed up. Hallelujah. And listen, you might even be saved and you say, well, you know, I, I believe I'm saved. I believe, Lord, okay, but I don't feel quite as excited as you preacher it's okay just keep on serving the lord come on get up get up put your clothes on oh i was thinking about this today when i was praying ain't that some stuff though if you think about it if you look at the themes within scripture i don't warm myself up if you look at the themes within scripture adam and eve are walking in the cool of the day with the lord and then all of a sudden when they disobey god what happens they neck it they neck it And what do they try to do? Cover themselves with fig leaves with the works of their own hands. Religion. Trying or or man's strength. Oh, let me cover myself. And fear strikes their heart. And they're like, oh, I'm all undone. Let me hide myself from God. And then the Lord comes to walk in the cool of the day. Where are you, Adam? Hiding behind a tree. Who told you that you were naked, that you had to put them fig leaves on yourself? And from that time moving forward, there's a theme in the Word of God where God says, he starts off, he says, them fig leaves ain't going to work, my friend. He kills the first animal. He brings forth the first sacrifice, and he clothes Adam and Eve with the first sacrifice, and he covers them. And from that point moving forward, there's a theme in Scripture. Where the covering of the Lord, where we're, where we're told even in Galatians 3 and 27 that those of you that have been baptized into Christ Jesus, you have put him on. You have been clothed with Christ Jesus. That's a beautiful thing to be clothed with the righteousness of Jesus. No longer seen as guilty by the Father. Hallelujah. Instead, when the Father looks at you, he sees righteousness. He sees the righteousness of Jesus. Amen. And I just want to encourage you with that because guess what? That's not the last garment. The last garment is you're going to be clothed upon with white robes. Hallelujah. You're going to be part of the heavenly choir. You're going to be clothed in the righteousness, the final righteousness of Jesus. Amen. This doesn't have anything to do with my message, so don't try to figure it out. I'm just telling you that the Lord wants you to know that guess what? He woke up and he was clothed and in his right mind. Hallelujah. And God wants to clothe you with the righteousness of Jesus. But look, if you're going to walk straight, look, sometimes when the gifts are flowing, it makes you want to jump high. Huh? But the Lord is not always that worried about how high you can jump, my friend. Because after you come down off the mountain, you got to walk for the Lord. The Lord wants to know how straight you can walk too. How do I walk straight, Lord? The Word of God will teach you. The Spirit of God through the Word. Oh, but that don't happen fast enough. Look, man, this isn't, this isn't quick bake. Yeah, he'll, go, he'll bring it from the frying pan. I told Danielle today she was cooking a roast. I'm like, boy, you need to. I didn't say call her boy. I said, you, did you braise that piece of meat? I don't know nothing about cooking. Well, I know a little bit. Did you braise that piece of meat and get it real dark in the bottom of the pan? Because if you're going to use a crock pot, and this is just my idea. Look, he goes, he takes it from the frying pan, and he'll put, but he put, he's going to put you in a crock pot. Because it takes time. 
Sanctification is a process. Amen. He wants to minister to you immediately. Look, he wants to do a suddenly. He wants to bring deliverance and freedom, and he wants to pull stuff out of you. Hallelujah. He wants to put stuff in you. But, but praise God. Look, he also wants you to be steadfast. He wants you to learn endurance. He wants you to learn patience. He wants you to learn the fruits of the Spirit, temperance, amen? And he does not want the gifts to be exalted. I'll tell you that. We're about to start a series on the latter-day movement. We'll do that next week. But I just wanted to give glory to the Lord tonight. I'm excited, man. I'm excited about what the Lord is showing me in my own life. I'm excited about what the Lord, I believe the Lord wants to do, amen, in, in, in us, in all of us. Um, you know, that's another thing. I was, when I was laying there uh, that night, and, and I was like, Lord, wow. Like, I mean, look, two, I'm just, can I be real? Y'all might be watching on video, and it's okay. Two, no, kind of like in the world of the church. Like I'd, be like, I'd be like, okay, let's post on Facebook. Brother, brother Kirk and sister Brenda Young came to the church. Who's Kirk and Brenda Young? That's, what, the, that, that's what, I'm, what I'm trying to tell you is that's how the church responds. I don't know them people. Well, you, should, you don't need to know them by name, but you should have been there because you'd have seen the Lord moving through them people. Yeah. Amen. And that's what you need to know. You need to know they're working for Jesus. That's really what you need to know. You don't need to know the servant's name. Hallelujah. You need to know that the Lord showed up. Amen. And, and, you know, as I was thinking about that, I was like, Lord, you just used. And I just heard that sister Lily that sat there and tarried with Devin at the altar. I'm like, look, Lord, you use some people and you got gifts that are flowing in people's lives. And I was like, man, it's just some beautiful gifts to see them manifest. Amen. And we've been praying for the gifts. I'm like, I've been praying for a long time. Lord, use me that way. And every now and then, give me a little word here and there. But guess what? Maybe the Lord's saying, you, you can't handle the gifts too. I called you to preach and teach. You ain't ready for all that yet. You'd be like the Apostle Paul thinking you got all these abundant revelations. They got to stick a thorn in your side because you're going to get all puffed up. I don't know if that's what it is. I'm just telling you, I've been praying. And guess what? If the Lord wants to send people in to operate that bed, who am I to say that the Lord can't have his way with the church? I was excited. But as I laid in the bed and I thought about those gifts, I saw y'all. I'm telling you, it was like a vision almost where I was standing right here and I was looking at the crowd. And I could see Robert. He said, he got gifts, man. He got the gift of faith. He laid hands on people and believed that they'll be recovered. Got people like Sabrina. She got gifts. Jessica. You know, Jessica probably, be like, I ain't got no gift. Oh, no, trust. <laughs> Please don't leave because the gift of helps ministry amen like look dude there's people doing a whole lot of stuff behind the scenes you know the lord showed me the lord showed me hannah the lord showed me brennan the lord showed me a lot of people in the church okay i want to move through my people i give them all gifts man you know, i know they might not all be the gifts that everybody wants he even showed me that when i was at the conference he said ain't nobody really wants your gift man <laughs> now come on now i'm just telling you what the lord told me it was kind of funny because I thought somebody was asking for somebody's number, and I was like, oh, you want his number? She's like, no, he got you for that. <laughs> I was like, okay, yeah, I'm the pastor. He got you for that. I was like, all right, yeah. And you know, and the, you know what the Lord said? Instead of me getting aggravated about it, because you know me, I get in my flesh, the Lord was like, well, that's true, man. Nobody really wants your gift. Yeah, who wants to? Can I just talk like it is? Can we just be real with each other? Because I'm a sheep, too, okay? Yes, I'm a pastor, but I'm also a sheep. Sheep are prone to wander, my friend. And the Lord said, ain't nobody really wants your gift. They want, people want to see the manifestations and the gifts and the operation of the Holy Ghost. But nobody really wants to be the shepherd. Nobody wants to have, because you see, it's the job of the shepherd to lead the sheep to still waters. It's the job of the shepherd to lead the sheep to green pastures. And in the word of the Lord, I can promise you there's green pastures and there's still waters. There's tranquility for your soul. There's solace for your heart. There's peace for your mind because he's the prince of peace. And if you preach Jesus and you embrace him, he will bring peace. But listen, sometimes people ain't really ready for all that. 
Sheep are prone to wander. You can lead a sheep into a great pasture. Look at that, rolling hills, man. You see that? The grass is long and it's green and it's waving in the wind. And look, here we brought you here, sheep. And I'm not talking about y'all specifically. I'm just talking about the sheep of God. Y'all okay with that? Don't get all offended on me. I'm going to speak truth. And when I speak to you, I speak to me. And you're going to have this beautiful flowing pasture, and it's waving in the wind, and then all of a sudden there's one clump of clover over there, and what's that sheep going to do? I don't know much about agriculture, but I heard that if an animal eats clover, what happens? He gets bloated up and full of gas. Well, you got a whole field of green grass and the Word of God for you to be feeding on, and instead you're going to go over there, and you're going to feed on a clump of clover. And then you're going to wonder why. You're going to wonder why. Why am I hurting? Why am I sick in my spirit, man? Oh, the, the Lord led me to tranquil waters. Look how peaceful this water. Man, there ain't enough happening up in that water. That water ain't moving fast enough for me. It ain't even got no whirlpools in it. Like, I don't want that water. Find me another river, preacher. Find, or, or somebody, Lord, send me to another river. I want another river that's a little bit more exciting. End up a little life, like I tell you all all the time, like Jerry Springer. People love chaos, my friend. People love drama. Look, I know. How you know so much about that, preacher? <laughs> Come on now. I done live drama. I've lived chaos. Something in us. Driving us to it. Lord, I don't want that no more. I want peace. I want the Prince of Peace. Hallelujah. All right. Let's get into this word right here. I, I titled it tonight, Submit and Resist. Because look. If we're going to rise up and we're going to walk with the Lord, we have to understand that there's times that we have to resist the temptations of the Lord, of the enemy, right? Like the enemy will constantly bring things your way. He's going to constantly bring things your way. And listen, one of the things that I've learned about Tricky Trick is this. Tricky Trick makes it look real pretty on the front end. He makes it look bright and shiny, and it just seems so pleasant. And it just doesn't seem really all that bad. You understand what I'm saying? But if you don't know the word of the Lord, see, nothing God will ever give you or do for you or bring to you is ever going to transgress his word. Sorry, church. If it's written in his word and it says it's wrong, it's wrong. Uh, now, we all got wrong stuff in our heart. Come on, don't get religious on me because that's another thing that the Lord showed me. The Lord showed me, is it possible that in your endeavor to stay pure to doctrine that you yourself have picked up a spirit of religion? I'm telling you right now it's possible. I'm telling you right now it's probably likely. And all I can tell you is that if it happened to me, it probably happened to you. Come on, somebody. Self-righteousness. Oh, man, them church down the road, they don't understand what we understand. They probably don't. But instead of us being kind and humble and praying for them. Lord, touch the church over there. Touch that preacher. They got people in, your, in this church that need to hear the truth of the gospel. They need to hear what Paul said. Hallelujah, that the old man has died in Christ. He's been buried in Christ. And a new man has been resurrected to newness of life. Hallelujah. Lord, help us. You know, I was thinking, too, this is something, I don't know, maybe I was supposed to preach this next week, but... I was talking to a couple of people, and I thought this was good. So this is a spiritual exercise. Let's not call it a mental exercise because that just makes it really, really weird, and then we, like, want to get up and walk out. We're going to call it a spiritual exercise. All right. So some of you might just be visiting tonight, and you really don't know too many people in here, but you, you'll be able to follow along with somebody that you do know. So Say you got somebody in this church right here, right now. You can kind of look around real quick, and you can scan the room if you want to. Go ahead. I'm giving you. Go ahead. Scan the room. Look. Okay, I want you to find somebody that really irritates you. No, really. I'm about to do something right here. You ready? You ready for this? We're about to poke around. Like James Falls told me one time after I preached the message, he said the Lord was in my heart kicking boxes all over the place. So did, you light, did your eyes light upon somebody that just really, really, really irritates you? I got a purpose here. All right. All right. So you, now I need you to focus. I need you to think about that person in your mind. You got that person in your mind, and I need you to think about that thing that irritates you, whatever it is. The, now, look, oh, there's ten things. Okay, think about the most irritating thing. All right? You, get, you with me? Y'all follow me? Now, now I want you to think about something good in that person. 
something godly. Oh, I can't think of nothing godly because, you know, sometimes when you talk to people, they're like, you done messed me up, dude. All I can think about is that irritating thing. Okay, well, look, were they in church tonight, huh? Oh, they in church tonight. If you're thinking about somebody, they're in the house of the Lord. Hallelujah. They might, they might even love the word of God. They might like to worship if you watch them, you know. I know some of the, sometimes the musicians, they over there singing, and then they, like, they open up one of their eyes to try to see what everybody's doing. See, they, they judging y'all. No, I'm just playing. So look, so you thought of something irritating, then you thought of something good. All right, now this is the tricky part. You got to be honest with yourself, because I'm not asking you who it is. I'm not asking you what it is. It ain't none of my business. It's between you and the Lord. And don't even go, don't if, you, if you're somebody's wife or you're somebody, don't be asking your spouse. No, you can't if they want to share it with you. I don't want to control what goes on in, in y'all's house. But I'm just trying to say this is that it's for a purpose. All right. So now you're thinking about that person. So let's just pretend that I said their name to you. Hey, did you see such and such? Did you see so and so? All right. What, which one of them things immediately pops up in your head. The irritating thing or the good thing? Uh-oh. Micah, Micah told the truth with her face. The, 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 the irritating thing is usually what comes up, right? Come on, somebody. Let's be real. Now, the last question for this little spiritual exercise is, which one do you think the Holy Spirit wants you thinking? See, that's what I'm trying to say because that's even deeper. It gets even deeper because in the book of Acts, they were all of one mind and one accord. They weren't walking in division. They weren't walking in sex, S-E-C-T-S, divisions. They weren't walking in the lust of the flesh, right? Uh, they were walking in the fruit of the Spirit. Their hearts were humbled because they were in the presence of the King. Look, the Lord, the Lord is ministering. And listen, when you get into the presence of the Lord, look, we're going to talk about some of this stuff that's been going on in the church the last couple of year, year, hundred years. I'm going to show you some video. We're gonna, not tonight, but we, next week we'll start. We're going to break it down. But let me tell you something. When you really get into the presence of the Lord, let me tell you what's going to happen. How you know? Well, I've been in the presence of the Lord, but I'm going to base it off of Scripture. Isaiah, the, one of the greatest prophets that ever lived. Isaiah chapter 6, in the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on the throne, and the train of his veil filled the temple with glory, and the seraphim began to cry, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And the posts of the temple began to shake, and the and prophet Isaiah says, woe unto me, woe unto me, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live amongst a people of unclean lips. No, listen to me, friend. When you get into the presence of the Lord, you are not uh, dapping him. No, we like, no, he is. He's a friend. He said, I call you friend. That's what Jesus said. I no longer call you servant. I was praying it today. I call you friend because a servant doesn't know what his master's doing. And the Lord wants you and I to know what he's doing because he wants us to partner with him. But when you get into the true presence of God, ain't a whole lot of dapping going on, my friend. It's more like, Whoa, whoa unto me, oh Lord. Oh Lord, cleanse my heart. Purify me, Lord. Purify me. That's what the Holy Spirit wants. He wants to purify our hearts. Amen. Praise God. So in the gospel, in the, you know, one of the things about James, I don't really preach it a whole lot because some people, I think that, I think that this is like a mental block that I receive. Well, James and Paul didn't agree. The word of God agrees. Okay. But James is a little too practical for me. You know, I'm a little bit more spiritual. But I was reading this today. I was like, dude, this is spiritual. This is a major spiritual stuff right here. But let's just go ahead and read. We'll do a little commentary as we go. And then I just got a couple of points to make at the end. So what is, and I'm using the NASB. I like the King James Version, but I don't feel like breaking down Old English tonight. I just want you to see. And I've looked back and forth at a couple of other uh, translations. So what is the source of quarrels and conflicts? Now, we're talking about he's writing to the church. And within a church, many times there can be quarrels and conflicts. So he says, what is the source of this among you? Is not the source your pleasures? Some, look, we can take a look real quick. Let's see what the King James says right here. For pleasures. Even of your lusts. The word lust there. Okay. Uh, I know y'all don't really like it too much, but the NIV what does it say? Your desires. So you get the point. You do understand that the word lust is epithumia, 
And what the word literally means is a desire, and depending on the context, it can actually be something good. For the Spirit lusts, see? The Spirit desires all of you. The Spirit desires all of me, all right? So what causes the quarrels and the fights and all of the things going on? Is it not your lusts? Is it not your desires? Because you see, the truth is, is that if we're honest with one another, as believers, many times, we're still kind of like two-year-olds, right? Can I, is, is that just the truth? I know sometimes my preaching is too hard, but no, it's just the truth. And we should embrace the truth, and we should love the truth. And if we're honest with one another, sometimes we act like some two-year-olds. I'm talking about when we don't get our way. When we don't get our way, what do we do? We don't like it. We don't want to hear it. So, so we, we exit stage left. And we, don't want, and we just want to move on with our own little world. I don't want you kicking boxes around in my heart, preacher, okay? But the Lord wants you and I to know, hallelujah, that, look, he wants to bring correction. Look, you lust and you do not have, so you commit murder. Whoa. Well, I ain't never killed nobody. I ain't never killed nobody. Okay, well, here we go right here. First John chapter 3, verse 15. This is what the Word of God says. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Jesus said that if, you, if you're angry with your brother, then you've already committed murder. But that's not the same thing. I'm telling you what the Word of God says. When we have animosity and hatred in our heart, when all we think about is those irritating aspects of that brother or sister in the Lord, we're operating in another spirit, my friend. It's not the Holy Spirit. It is not the Holy Spirit. It is another spirit that we've been overwhelmed and 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 overwhelmed. Not obtain. You fight and you quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. And then you ask and you do not receive. Why? Because you ask with wrong motives. Yeah, like, right? How many times have you prayed? Like, I don't know about you, but the longer I'm in the faith and the better I understand the word, the Lord reveals to me places where I've been in the past and the things I was asking for. And the Lord's like, son, you was asking for some stuff that, number one, if I would have given it to you, you probably would have destroyed yourself. Number two, you're asking with the wrong motives. That's why I got a problem with the Word of Faith movement. That everything that they're asking for, oh, no, I'm going to hold God accountable to his word. And his word says that I'm going to be rich or whatever. You know, that Jesus didn't have, that the birds of the air have nests and the foxes have holes and the Son of Man had not a place to lay his head. And he became poor so that we could be made rich. And so there you go. That's the one scripture in the Bible I'm going to hold on to. He became poor so I could become rich. Now I'm going to sow my $1,000 seed and I'm about to get a million dollars in the bank. Come on. Come on, somebody. That's what it is. That's what's going on on, on television. That's the prosperity message. That's what they're preaching. Do you think God has called every last one of us in this place to be millionaires? Do you think that that is what God is most concerned about? Some of you may become millionaires. Okay, and hallelujah for that. I hope you pay your tithes. But in the meantime, that is not what the emphasis of the word of God is teaching. The emphasis of the word of God is that souls would be saved, that disciples would be made, and that there would be a great harvest in the end. So sometimes we ask with wrong motives so that we can spend it on our own pleasures. You adulteresses. I didn't write this, my friend. You adulteresses. Do you not know that friendship with the world is, in the King James Version, enmity or hatred against God? And that friendship with the world in this version is hostility towards God. Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the scripture speaks to no purpose? He jealously desires the spirit which he has made to dwell in us. The Holy Spirit jealously desires to have not just a piece of you, but all of you. Listen, lukewarm Christianity ain't going to get it done, my friend. The word of God says, I want it all. And let Jesus gave it all. Jesus didn't quit halfway up the hill. Jesus didn't say, oh, it's a little too hard, Father. I can't go one more step. No. He went up the hill. He was obedient to the Father's will. He died on the cross. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising its shame. 
Because he knew what he was called to do. He knew what he was called to do. It's sad so many Christians don't really know what they're called to do. And I don't, now listen, I don't mean that with the wrong spirit. I mean that with the right spirit. They don't know. You know, it's a beautiful thing when you see a Christian family and everybody's dressed real nice and they take their little, their portrait. And I'm not, sometimes, Lord, forgive me, I use adjectives that make it sound like I'm being, you know, I don't want to do that. Help me, Lord. They have their portrait, their family portrait, and it looks real clean. And maybe it's in front of a picket fence. And you get the point. And they think in their mind that this is Christianity. I'm here to tell you, God doesn't mind you having a picket fence. And he's okay if you got a, I don't know, if the husband wears Calvin Klein and the wife shops it and wherever women shop that have taste now. Okay, Uh, and whatever. Okay, he's okay with all that if you can afford it as long as you ain't charging up your credit card and going into debt because the Bible says, oh, no man, no thing. All right. But nevertheless, as, as, as pretty as that looks, that's not God's will on this earth. The nations rebelled against him at Babel. He dispersed the nations, and he's bringing them back to him. He says in in Revelation chapter 5, the lamb has purchased the souls of men through his blood from every tongue, tribe, and nation. You want to know what Pentecost is about, my friend? It's about bringing the nations back to God. Father, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. (laughs) Hallelujah. He's bringing them back. He's going to bring them back. That's the will of God for your life that you would be a witness for the Lord. Oh, preacher, you make me feel uncomfortable. Ain't nobody told you to go running out there right now. The Lord will fix you. The Lord will fix you. I got to tell people sometimes I told somebody earlier, baby, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I'm trying to sanctify you. Can I just be real? Sorry I'm trying to sanctify you. Now, at the same time, there's always balance. The Word of God says we need to be sanctified folk. The Holy Spirit is the one that wants to sanctify us. What does it mean to be sanctified? Separate and holy. You've been made holy in Christ. Jesus paid a high price for you to be able to be sanctified. Jesus paid a high price for you to be able to live a life that brings glory to God. Amen? He jealously desires. But he gives a greater grace. Therefore, it says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Oh, man, that's so good. You could preach that for days. God is opposed to the proud. Do, do you, do, sometimes we got pride in us that's so deep-seated that we don't even realize it's there. Amen? I mean, sometimes I just see things. That I'm just like, oh, Lord, that's ugly in me. And I didn't even I, 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 to be honest with you, if y'all know me real good, y'all, you'd be like, yeah, I tried to tell you that last year. <laughs> I tried to tell you that last year, dude, and you wouldn't listen to me. Okay, well, that's because I needed the Holy Spirit to show me. Amen? But thank you for trying because I believe that you're supposed to do that. Amen? I'm okay with it, dude. If y'all see something wrong with me, let me know. <clears throat> I can't promise y'all agree. At least not right then and there. Maybe next year I'll be like, dude, you were right. <laughs> You were so right. Amen. He gives grace to the humble. Do you want the grace of God moving in your life? Hallelujah. I want grace moving in my life. I don't want to be resisted. I don't want to be opposed by God. I don't want to be full of pride. You know, I've always said this. um, The idea of opposition is it's kind of like I think a good illustration is when you take two magnets and you put them on opposite sides. And what does it do? It kind of like you ever tried to put two magnets together like that and you can feel it? I feel like it's it's repelling. Instead, it's opposition is like a repelling. Okay, and instead of a connecting, right? And, and I feel like what the Lord's saying is, is that when he opposes the proud, this is just my commentary on it. What is the, what is the first sin ever? Pride. Pride in the enemy. He said, I will exalt myself above the throne of God. And he, and he, and he tried to exalt him, and he was cast down. So I've said this before. I've preached it many a times. People that have been here, you've heard it. Hopefully you don't, you don't go to sleep on me. But let me just say this, that, that God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. I've often wondered if when God senses pride in the life of the believer, it's almost like he goes on guard. I know God ain't scared of nothing. He ain't scared of the devil. But you get the, I'm trying to give you a human illustration. It's kind of like if somebody walks up in the house or they walk, I can guarantee you if some 
crazy looking person started walking up in here and like was wielding a weapon or something like that, then then we'd be, you know, we, we're going to get ready. Something's going to happen, right? Something's going to happen. You're going to get ready to, to, to engage something. They might be sorry when it's all said and done that they walked up in here. But anyway, I'm just saying. It might, it, that may happen. So just, just a little notice. Okay, but nevertheless, with all that being said and done, God opposes the proud. Right, And he's repelled against it because I believe he sees Satan in that. I know that's harsh, but I believe that the Lord, he sees the enemy in that, you know. Whereas when he sees humility, who do you think he sees then? Mm. Jesus. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, though he were in the form of God. He did not consider it something to be held on to, but instead he humbled himself and he became a servant. Hallelujah, so that he could die, even the death of the cross. That's the humility of our Savior right there. Submit, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be miserable and mourn and weep. Dude, I was thinking, you know how, like, Micah asked me the other day. I was busy, but finally got back to her. She said, could you send me that song by Keith Green you played on the video the other day about asleep in the light? And then I was, I was thinking about this verse. I was thinking about another song that brother wrote, and it, he says that. Be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. It's like, what? Dude, I don't want to be part of that church. Look, this is what the Lord's saying to his people. Like, in other words, you got to realize that if you're not right or if we're not right, that we get our heart right. That's really what he's trying to say. You know, he just wants us to be aware when things aren't right in our life that we get right with him. Amen? Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord and he will exalt you. Do not speak against one another. Boy, I thought that was good right there. Do not speak against one another. That was really when I was supposed to give y'all that little spiritual exercise right there and, and make y'all think about how sometimes we feel about other people in the body of Christ. Lord, help us. Amen. Do not speak against one another, brethren. He who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law but a judge of it. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and to destroy, but who are you who judge your neighbor? Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. Yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. I love this part. You are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that you'd help us, Lord God, to understand your word. Holy Spirit, I pray that you'd open our eyes, open our ears, oh Lord God, that we could hear and see the truth of your word and prepare our heart like good soil to receive the seed of your gospel in Jesus' name. Your life is just a vapor. It's going to be here today and gone tomorrow. Isn't that something? But we're just living for today, aren't we? We're living for today. I love that old, that old revivalist, and I know I've said it many times, but Leonard Ravenhill, and he said, listen, today is just a dress rehearsal for eternity. He believed it. As much as you read the Bible, and some of y'all, I've been friends with y'all for a while. We've talked so much about the Scripture, and, I, and I, in, in many conversations I've said, he just keeps showing me in the Word that there's an eternity to embrace. And sometimes it's so difficult on this earth. Because we're sensual creatures. We smell things and we see things and we tactile and we touch and we hear. And we're so connected to this physical realm that it makes it hard for us to see the spiritual. Yeah, listen, you're, I'm talking to you. I'm the preacher. The, I'm the guy that the Lord showed up in a bathroom, a stinky barroom bathroom. After 12 years, you knew me, Mary. After 12 years of going to church at Twin City or Cornerstone and then ended up after the misery of my sister taking her life and was sneaking beer in the backyard and, oh, Lord, I can't say it, but like watching stuff on pornography, stuff on computer and doing things that people do when they watch pornography. Let's just leave it like that. Like that that's the more better version 
But here I am, bound up, going to church, wanting to be free. And I end up in a bar room. I ain't been in a bar room in 12 years. Who cares? You've been drinking quarts of beer in the backyard. What's the difference, the religious preacher? I wasn't a preacher then. And I show up in the, I mean, but it could have been. <laughs> I show up in that barroom bathroom. I know y'all heard the story. I'm in the, I'm in the stall, two guys at the latrine. My old lady left me, life stinks is the story. And the Lord all of a sudden out of nowhere shows up in a place that I never would have thought he'd show up. And I've always been so grateful that he did that. I wish I could tell you that I ain't never fell again. I wish I could tell you I ain't never thought a wrong thought. I wish I could tell you I ain't never touched nothing I shouldn't have touched, but that's not true. And then I'd be a lying preacher. But I do want to tell you this. The Lord showed up and he spoke to my heart and he said this. Listen to them. They need me. And they all need me. And look at you. I can't even use you. Oh, you've always been willing to tell people about me. But only in a way where you could still look cool. No, you will lay your life down before me, and this is it. This is the clincher. You will present my word for the way that it is written, and then I will use you. In other words, he told me later on, keep your, this is how God speaks to me. Maybe it's because my dad was a Marine. I don't know. Keep your grubby little fingers out of my word, preacher man. Let my word speak to my people. Let my word speak to my people. Let it cleanse them. Let them choose whether they will embrace it or not. You know, I was thinking when I was laying in bed earlier, thinking about the word of God, and I was thinking, Lord, I feel like you, that's what you want your people, you, you want your ministers to bake bread, huh? Whoop up a good loaf of bread. Now, if you're anything like me, Back when I was young, I didn't like the kind of good bread that they say is good today. I like that white stuff, right? And now, if you like white bread, I ain't trying to call you out. That's between you and the Lord. I'm just saying, when I was a kid, I liked white bread. And then I'd be like, Mama, you got to cut that crust off of there, right? And then, and then sometimes, like, you know what, what you want to do? Why don't you go ahead and toast that and slap a little butter on it and give me some cinnamon and some sugar and make it nice and sweet, huh? That's the kind of bread I want to eat. But the Lord wants whole grain. <laughs> that stuff will cleanse you out, right? <laughs> that stuff will cleanse you out. You get the point that I'm trying to make. It's the, it's the true bread of God. And really and truly white bread, even if you like it, white bread is not really good for you because it's man's, man's messing with it. You understand what I'm saying? The same thing can happen with the word of the Lord. Man messes with it. He sticks, well, for lack of better words, his grubby little fingers in the word of God, and he creates some little loaf of bread concoction that was never what God intended it to be, and people are just consuming it. And instead of it being nutritious and cleansing them like it's supposed to cleanse them, they end up getting sick. They don't, I mean, bread is one thing that can get you sick. I'm not trying to say, what you, I didn't mean to mix medicine in this, but I'm just saying, if you eat enough bread, even if it's good bread, then you will increase your glycemic index, and it will pump out too much insulin, and leftover insulin will turn into fat. And fat not just on the outside, fat on the inside. It'll get on your organs, and then it'll begin to cause diabetes and high cholesterol, metabolic syndrome. So what I'm trying to say is, is that just like white bread, enriched white bread or too much even, well, you can't say that about the Word of God, but too much of that thing will cause a problem. And just like the wrong doctrine will cause a problem, the wrong teaching will cause a problem. Lord, help us to hang on to your truth. I really just wanted to talk to you real quick tonight about these two verses. One of them is verse 4, where it says in verse 4, you adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility towards God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. I'm going to come over here for a second, and I'm going to grab a couple of chairs, because I was thinking about trying to think about it, some type of an illustration that would, that would maybe show, thank you, sir, what, what that might look like. And so I was thinking about this word friend. And, well, friendship is philia, which is where we get the word Philadelphia, which is the city of brotherly love. Philia is friendship, and it means fondness. And philos means a dear friend. I'm actively fond of you. I want to be friendly to you. I want to be your associate. 
I want to be your neighbor. I want to be friendly with you, okay? And so here's believer and here's world. I love you, cosmos. That's the word in the Greek. I love you, you set order of arranged things that are currently going on today. I love this world. I love its communication. I love the things that it tells me. There's a whole lot of stuff going on in this world right now that they're trying to convince me of that I know ain't right because I read my word. I read my word, my friend, and it says something different than what that world's trying to tell me. There's a spirit in the world. It's the spirit of Antichrist. It's the spirit of Jezebel. It's been around since the beginning of time, and it's a lying spirit. The devil speaks lies. He only knows one language. Jesus said it. You're of your father, the devil. You lied because he lied from the beginning. And here we cuddle up. Friendship with the world. Oh, I want to be just like them. I like the clothes they wear. I like the cars they drive. I like the commercials that they play. Oh, man, I love the way they make me feel. You know, and that's what's going on. Fondness. I want to be your friend. I want to be your associate. Listen to me. Friendship with the world is enmity with God. You let the world communicate to you. You let the world whisper to you. You let the world convince you that they got the right way and you got the wrong way. You're going to have trouble, Christian. That was the first thing that I wanted to tell you, that you and I are not to be friends with the world. We are not to be friends with the world. Now, I'm one of these guys. I don't believe in isolation. I, I believe in separation. Well, what does that mean? Well, so it says that do you not think, let's see, it was verse 4, right? Whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Amen. God does not want us to be friends with the world. And, and again, if I isolate myself from people that are in the world, then they may never be able to hear the truth of the gospel. So, so God doesn't want me to isolate myself. He doesn't want me to sit in a church that thinks it's so holy that it can't be touched. I used to have a preacher that I used to sit under, and I was all excited about something God was showing me. And I went up to tell him something. He's like, don't touch the anointed before I get up on the stage. Wow. All I can say is this. No, it happened. And all I can say is this. I ain't making stuff up because I got better things to do. If I'm going to lie, it sure ain't going to be about something silly like that. All right. By the grace of God, I ain't going to lie. <laughs> But what I'm trying to say is this, is that I thought later on, I'm like, dude, ain't that some stuff? Like, here I am in your church trying to grow, and I'm excited about God, and I try to go tell you about something. Please, if you're excited about something, I hope you know that I'm approachable. I think y'all have learned that. Most of y'all got my phone number. Give me a call. Let's talk about the Lord and what he's doing in your life. All right? But, but, here, but here this brother said, touch not the anointed. <laughs> I've got to go preach. And I thought later, about a couple years later, I'm like, what, that, what, was, that, what was that dude thinking, man? Because I'm thinking, dude, if you lose the anointing because I touch you, I hate to break the news to you, boss. You never had it. If, if little old Matt Abair is going to steal the anointing from you, you ain't really had it. That's what I say. Maybe I'm wrong, but that's what I say. So he says, submit, therefore, to God. Resist the devil. And he will flee from you. But he gives more grace. Wherefore he says, that's in verse 6. But he gives a greater grace. Therefore it says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. What I'm trying to say is the devil is always swinging that carrot in your nose. I've talked about this many a time, but he, he made a tree and put it in the midst thereof. <laughs> the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and the tree of life, both in where? Not on the far end corner. Not on that right, way back there in the back of the garden, in that little corner over there where you can't see it. Nope, right there in the midst thereof. And after they partook and sinned and was disobedient to God, now a sinful nature on the inside of Adam's loins, if I could say it like that, all of his offspring born and bound up with a sinful nature. And now a choice to be made every day. The tree in the midst thereof. Lord, why couldn't you put it on the, floor, the far corner where I didn't have to see it every day? No, 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 no. My grace is sufficient for you. For in your weakness, my strength is made perfect. 
Hallelujah. Isn't that, that's good news right there, my friend. Did you? No, 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 no. Y'all didn't hear what I just said. Paul, it, Jesus told the Apostle Paul, he, I, Apostle Paul says, I, because of the many abundant revelations that I was receiving, and, and so that pr- I would not be puffed up with pride, God sent a messenger of, from Satan to buffet me. I asked the Lord thrice, King James Version, to remove this thing from me, this thorn in my side, and the Lord said, no. Because, see, my grace is sufficient for you. In your weakness, my strength is made perfect. Can you believe that tonight? Can you believe that when you're weak and you can't get the strength that you need, that that's exactly when the Lord plans to show up and to bring deliverance because you ain't going to get the glory. He will. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Submit to God. Resist the devil. He gives more grace. Amen. What does it mean to submit? The very word literally means to submit to one's control, to yield to one's admonition or advice, to submit to the control of the Lord. Dude, I don't know about you, but I've had a problem with authority in my life. I'm telling you right now. I was telling somebody the other day, I was talking to a policeman in New Iberia, and I was telling him because he was in the hospital. Uh, he's guarding the hospital. I was a nurse practitioner. We had this weird occurrence. I told you all about that woman that stabbed that man and all that stuff. <laughs> anyway, I'm talking to him about the Lord. And I'm like, man, dude, I appreciate you. He's like, really? I'm like, yeah, I do. I said, I don't know if you ever thought about this, but this is what I believe. I believe there's a spirit in here. He's like, what you talking about? A spirit against authority. See, the Word of God says... That to respect the authorities. I said, look, dude, I ain't got to tell you, but they got some crooked cops out there. But at the same time, they got some good ones. And what would we do if we had no police force? Come on, somebody. Oh, it might happen. It might happen sooner than you want it to. But that's another story for another time. And, 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 but, but I can remember one time sitting in the car after I was saved and I was going to Twin City Gospel. I pulled up at Canada's. Y'all know what I'm talking about. I was in front of them little doors right there, Canada's. And I don't know what I did, but the policeman saw me. I'm always doing something. That, you know, I don't drive right. I drive too fast. I drive too slow. I always do something that ain't right, right? And I pulled up in there and I was just chilling behind the wheel. I don't even know what I was waiting for. And he walks up to the door and I'm like, man, look at this dude here. I already still got that bad attitude, boy. Look, don't like, no, don't like no cop. Authority. I didn't know all that. I didn't know that's why I felt that way. But that just, I'm saved now, but I still got that rebellious spirit in me. All day is the cop coming to mess me up. <laughs> so look, I didn't know what I was. I didn't know what a new creation meant. I didn't know I was a new creation in Christ. So look what I did. I rolled the window down that much. <laughs> What you want? What's up, bro? What's up, bro? And, you know, and I don't even remember what all happened, but I just remember that. How cocky is that? How rude is that towards authority? Give you that much space, bro. Go ahead. Tell me what you need. Because I, I wasn't scared of no policeman. I done got beaten in the head by them people in Lafayette. Eight billy clubs on my head. All right? But that's because of the rebellious spirit. The rebellious spirit. Lord, break the rebellious spirit. Let me love authority. Let me love your authority. Let me love your word. Your word says for me to respect the authority. Amen? There's wickedness on the earth. There's people that don't act right, but the Lord knows how to take care of you in the midst of all that. To submit to one's control, to yield to one's admonition or advice. The Lord wants us to submit to him. Amen. You don't need to come around here trying to submit to me. And look, you submit to the Lord, me and you're going to be just fine. Amen. And you say, and now I submit to the Lord and you and me will be just fine. Amen. I, 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 just, I don't want, I want to be a control freak. I know, I know some of y'all think I am and I really didn't think I was. And maybe I was more of a control freak than I realized. I don't want to be a control freak. though. I don't want to micromanage your life. Any more than I want you micromanaging my life. Yeah. I just want to preach the truth and let God have his way. Amen? There's a lot of, what does it mean to submit to the Lord? I'm just going to read a couple of scriptures to you real quick. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19. It means a lot. I could pull out all kinds of scriptures to you, but let me just give you a couple. So we have, this is Peter talking, and let me give you the context. Peter's rem- remembering when he was on the Mount of Transfiguration, and he saw the Lord transfigured before his heart, you, before his eyes. Do you remember what Peter said when they were up on that mountain? He said, yeah, let's build a, tab- a couple of tabernacles, Lord. 
Let's build one for you, three of them, right? Let's build one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And the voice from heaven spoke and said, this is my son. In him I am well pleased. Hear him. Peter has some really good ideas. Not. This is probably 30 years later, maybe. He's writing this letter to the church. He says, we have the prophetic word made more sure to which you do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts. He said this. He said, I'm here to to deliver to you the message that I got off the Mount of Transfiguration. And this is the message. It's him. It's him. And you do well to heed for yourself the truth of the word of God until the day star rises rises in your heart. Who's the day star? Jesus, the light of God, rising in your heart. It's like a sunrise, man. When it's most dark, that sun comes up and brings light. Amen. Here's Deuteronomy 4, 9. This is Old Testament. Only give heed to yourself. Keep your soul diligently so that you do not forget the things which your eyes have seen. What I'm going to forget, Lord, You might forget that I split open the Red Sea and let you walk out on dry ground. Do you believe that tonight? I believe that. You might forget that I let the waters come back down on Pharaoh and his army. You might forget that I gave you water in the midst of the wilderness. You might forget that the waters of Mara were bitter, but we threw the stick in there, type of the cross, and we made the water sweet. You might forget that I rained down manna from heaven and took care of you. You might forget all my supernatural working and operation in your life. You might forget the day that you came to the altar and I touched your heart. You might forget because as you walk another day, two days, three days, it, gets, it starts to fade in your mind. The Lord would say, no, don't you forget. You take heed to yourself. You keep your soul diligently so that you do not forget the things which your eyes have seen. And they do not depart from your heart all the days of your life, but make them known to your sons and your grandsons. I can remember watching some lady on television one time. I don't like Christians because they brainwashing their children. I know I've said it a lot lately, but no, ain't no, no, ma'am, ain't nobody brainwashing nobody. We're washing their brain. And we're hoping that it takes because they still got a free will and they got to choose for themselves. But pray for your children, saints. Pray for your children. Don't let, listen, don't let your eyes get dry for your kids. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Make it known to your sons and your grandsons. I love that story. I know I'm preaching too long, but I love that story. When when you Exodus chapter 12, you talk about the Passover. You get into chapter 13 and 14, and the Lord Lord says, you keep keeping this Passover every year. Well, well, why do you want us to do that, Lord? Because, look, as you keep doing it, year after year, one day your son's going to say, Father, why do we do this? Why do we take our favorite little lamb and cut its throat and bleed its blood? Why do we roast him on the fire? Why do we go through this whole ritualistic thing of eating this lamb and eating these bitter herbs and doing this process? And that's when you're going to tell him because your God delivered you out from under the hand of Pharaoh with his mighty hand. That's what the Lord wants you to remember. See, you got a Passover lamb, my friend. His name is Jesus. He died on the cross to set you free from the power of sin. And we're to tell people about him. And maybe one day they might say, why do you keep talking about Jesus? Oh, I'm so glad you asked. (laughs) Because I once was a slave. And now I'm free. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And to resist means to oppose, to resist, to withstand. He says that if you will draw near to God, he will draw near to you. He says, cleanse your hands. You know, I looked up that word near, and this is the last thing I'm going to say. I may just go ahead and go ahead and throw another Keith Green song on you. The word nigh means to bring near, to join one thing to another. I was listening to this song earlier, and I thought it was so good. It's the name of the song is My Eyes Are Dry. My eyes are dry. Are you, have your eyes been dry? I'm just saying, lately, have your eyes been dry? I hope not. I hope your eyes been crying in the presence of the Lord. Amen. And, and, and look, praise God if they are. Praise God if they're wet. 
I like to see eyelashes that are wet. <laughs> Amen. And uh, let's just see what. And one of the things I want to tell you as, as, as I'm going to just stop right here and we're going to ask the Lord. We're going to contemplate and ask God to do a work in our heart. Like as, you're, as you're listening to the words, just pray the prayer. Um, you know, I don't want to keep you much longer. But I just want to say this. That as you hear the words coming off of this, this song. All right. And, and as you think about that other song when it said, Asleep in the Light. You know, and it, and it said, he sends people to your door and you just turn them away. And you say, God bless you, be at peace. And all heaven just weeps. Because Jesus came to your door and you left him out on the street. And then he's saying, open up, open up, give yourself away. No one cries. No one, no one even sheds a tear. But he, what does he say? He cries, he weeps, he bleeds, and he cares for your needs. What I'm trying to explain to you whenever you hear this other song and you think about that song, what you're hearing him sing, you're hearing a person that had a revelation of God's spirit and God's word. And his heart is broken for lost souls. It's not business as usual, see, and that's what revival fire is all about. Revival fire is all about cleansing the heart and making the heart hungry to see souls won into the kingdom. And if that's not what it produces, then it ain't good revival. All right, let's see what the Lord says. Thank you, Jesus.
Boy, isn't that a good lyric right there? <clears throat> pour, pour in the oil and the wine and wash me anew with the wine of your blood. The oil is you, your spirit of love, and the wine is the blood that cleanses us. Father, in the name.